Well, good morning, my friends. It's your old pal, Jordan the Lion. John and I are up a little early today, so we're going to go out and do some vlogging, and then we're going to come back and take CC out to lunch, and then I think we're going to head back to LA. I want to return my rental car tonight, because I have a planned vlog in the morning, and I don't want to mess around. So John and I are going to take you out. We're going to show you a handful of things that CC showed us yesterday, told us about. I did a little further research. I'm going to go show them to you now. Days with Jordan the Lion begins now. And I suppose you want to come too, huh? Would you like to come with me too? You ready to go outside? We're going to go for a little walk and then we're going to head out, Joster. Days with Jaw begins now too. Wow, look at that beautiful house. Isn't that something? Man, I'm telling you, Santa Barbara's full of them. Oh yeah, look at that one. God, these are beautiful. I could look at Victorian houses all day long, I'm telling you. So I noticed this theater the other day and we were driving by it and I just said, this is just too beautiful not to come by and take a look at the front during the day. Now look at the old ticket booth in here. Plus, CC was telling me this is one of those really great theaters that she said when you go inside, the whole ceiling is done up like a planetarium where you can see the stars and everything. So how cool is that? Yeah, the Santa Barbara International Film Festival happens here. Now I also noticed this that I wanted to point out. Old stagecoach route, 1861-1901. The first overland stagecoach arrived in Santa Barbara on Monday evening, April 1st, 1961. Celebrated by firing off cannon, many of Santa Barbara County's own stagecoach runs started from this spot, which marks the location of the first Arlington Hotel, destroyed by fire in 1909. Well, last night as we were driving, sitting at this intersection, I happened to look over here, and I saw this statue, and I said, well, that's pretty cool, what is that? So Cece started telling me the story, and I had to come back. This is a statue to Juana Maria. Now, basically what happened in the 1850s, Apparently a fur trader was thought to have been killed on the island off of Santa Barbara called San Nicolas. So they went to avenge his death and it was a bunch of Native American tribes or one tribe living on the island. So as the story I read was that they killed off some of the people that they suspected might have been involved and then they just decided to clear the island. So they brought everyone to the beaches to start loading them up and accounting for all of them. And apparently there are two stories. One was that Juana wasn't there. She just wasn't there. And this was a name given to her much later, Juana Maria. She wasn't there. They started seeing the tide changing and they thought that they were gonna run into some treacherous weather so they just left her behind. And over time people would talk about the legend of the woman left on San Nicolas and they would send back three or four different vessels looking for her and never find her. Finally, they offered a man $100, and he went back, and after 18 years, he noticed footprints. He kept looking around, then he noticed a whalebone hut. He noticed that there was a seal blubber drying out. He, he realized there was somebody living there, and it was this woman, Juana Maria. So he basically gathered her up, got her belonging. She was, she was wearing a, um, like a duck feather dress. Um, she had a whalebone needle that she would sew all of this stuff with and they said that she was in remarkably good health. Her teeth were basically worn down to the nub, but they brought her back to the mainland here and she lived in Santa Barbara. Now here's the thing though. She had lived on that island for 18 years alone and all the people they had brought from her tribe now there were only about three of them left and none of them could communicate with her or understand the language anymore. So they recorded a little bit of her speaking and they were able to um, record two of her songs and apparently they're in the Natural History Museum here in Santa Barbara. You can go and listen to them. Um, as well as they had a lot of her artifacts, her bone needle and things like that, but in the 1906 uh, earthquake they said where they were being stored they were damaged. And so a lot of that stuff doesn't exist and they said they donated her her dress to the Vatican and the Vatican has no record of it. So unfortunately what happened was they, they well they brought her to shore. She loved it here. She loved seeing the horses. She loved seeing the buildings and the architecture and just couldn't believe it. 
and she actually ended up dying very sadly um, seven weeks after being brought here uh, by dysentery. She was so um, used to not having nutrients and basically living on whale blubber and um, what else they say, uh, I believe like duck meat, um, that she just wasn't accustomed to all the vitamins that came in um, the plants and, and vegetables that she was eating and it, it ended up killing her. And they had had her living at the, um, at the mission here in Santa Barbara and so they, before she died, she was baptized in, they couldn't do it in her language, but she was baptized and they named her Juana Maria. And they have a, a, a play, resting place for her, I believe, in the mission. So they erected this statue in remembrance of Juana Maria. I just, when I read that story, I mean, after Cece told me the rundown of the story and then I read up, I said, geez, I just have to come by and show everybody this. What do you think, Chief? Was it worth the stop? Let's head towards the beach. Well, I decided to bring us back to the Santa Barbara Cemetery today. Since we kind of came towards the end of the day, I figured let's come back and see a couple of people we didn't get to see yesterday. Well, this is the, this is the mausoleum of the Battistone family. Now, this is a pretty well-known family in Santa Barbara because if you've ever heard of the restaurant diner chain Sambo's, ever controversial, he was one of the founders of Sambo's. And as luck would have it, the very first Sambo's ever has a pretty interesting story. It was started about a half a mile from here and it still exists. So after this trip to the cemetery, we're going to head over and I'm going to show you the old and original Sambo's. Well, we just about had an issue. I was walking around with my cell phone in my hand, looking at a picture online of where this grave was and two of the groundskeepers, like the lawn care guys, came up and started like yelling at me and saying, no, you gotta go get, you gotta go to the office and talk to them, you're not allowed to take photos here. So I went to the office and I said, hi ma'am, I was just literally walking around with my cell phone in my hands and was looking for a, a grave. I hadn't taken any pictures yet and these guys came up and yelled at me just because I wanted to take a picture. She goes, that's weird. Go take all the pictures you want. <laughs> So, who we came to see over here is a man that, if you were a 60s Disney fan, you know this name. We got, right here, we got his pop, Fess Parker Sr. But right over here is Davy Crockett, Daniel Boone himself, Mr. Fess Parker. How about that? Yeah, Davy Crockett. He was actually, um, apparently his family owned a vineyard here. So he had a business right across the street. I'm gonna take us and show us after this. But yeah, for six years, he was a Disney favorite portraying <laughs> both in TV movies and a television series. He was Davy Crockett and Daniel Boone. Now one of the cool things or one of the interesting things that kind of ties into my life in a weird way is that while we were looking for this yesterday, Cece was reading something about him and she said, that's interesting. He was going to open a theme park at one point. A, I believe it was a Davy Crockett theme park and it was projected to be opened in Kentucky. They were gonna do this frontier land type thing, probably similar to, uh, to Knott's Berry Farm. However, <clears throat> while he was gathering up investors, Kings Island came in, announced they were gonna open, they were like, less than a two hour drive away and all the investments dried up and the theme park never happened. Now oddly, apparently, I don't know what the story is, but he was not well liked in Santa Barbara by a lot of people I've heard. So the, uh, the place across the street now is owned by Hilton, but it was originally called Fess Parker's Red Lion Resort. So we'll go over there in a little bit. I wanna go find Ronald Coleman. I wanna go find the Hall of Fame pitcher, Eddie Matthews, and a couple other people and then we'll head out. Now here we have somebody that I really enjoy the work of, especially in a double life with my pal Shelly Winters. This is Ronald Coleman. He's the guy who at one point owned the San Ysidro Ranch that we saw yesterday. But Ronald Coleman won an Oscar in 1948 for the movie he made with Shelly Winters, A Double Life. And this was the first movie that she really this was like her 
debut breakout movie. And one of the interesting things about it was that she said her first take with him was like, took her like 42 times to get it right. And then when she finally got it right, she said the whole time he was encouraging her, making her feel good. And after the production, they used a bust of his face and he actually gave it to her. So when I used to go hang out at her house, I would see that bust from the movie in her living room. <laughs> and her daughter at one point when she was younger had taken a pencil and basically outlined all the eyes and the nose and everything. So it was kind of defaced a little bit and Shelly always said she was going to get it cleaned up. But fantastic actor and a big person out here in Santa Barbara. I mean, San Ysidro Ranch was huge. So to see that he has such a great curtain call stage grave is amazing. He was, I mean, he was a huge stage actor even before he broke into film. It says, our revels now are ended. These are our actors. As I foretold you, we're all spirits and are melted into air, into thin air. We are such stuff as dreams are made on and our little life is rounded with a sleep. Well, we found, I think, one of the last ones we're gonna stop and see. We got the Matthews family here. And right here, 500 plus home runs. One of the leaders, one of the greatest Hall of Famers to ever play the game. 1950s superstar for the Milwaukee Braves, Mr. Eddie Matthews. I think, I don't know what number he is on the all-time home run list. I think he's probably number seven, eight, something like that, but he was riding high until Mike Schmidt knocked him out. He was, I think, at number five at one point, and then I'm sure, you know, Barry Bonds is in there and all those people, so. Yeah, this was, he was a big one, man. One of the, they, they said one of the premier third baseman of his day, if not the premier third baseman of his day. Had to come by here and see Eddie Matthews before we left. Now the last place that I wanted to see today in here, it was Ronald Reagan's grave and they've turned it into just regular plots, but they showed me where it was. So I wanna take you over and show you where the original resting spot for our president Ronald Reagan was. Well, this patch of land right here directly in front of us, right in front of the ocean. Before there was a Simi Valley Ronald Reagan Presidential Library Museum and a final resting place of Ronald and Nancy Reagan, let's go take a look. What his eternal view originally was. Do you think he would have rather stayed here or be where he's at now? One of those things I just wonder about. Well, I'll say this, this is one of the most beautiful cemeteries I've ever been to, and I'll also say this, other than the little lawn care issue earlier with the guys coming up and giving me a hard time, when I went to the office because I couldn't find a person or I couldn't find a grave and ask, they were more than accommodating. And they must have cameras everywhere because when I asked for one of them, they said, well, it's right here and you've already been to Ronald Coleman, you've already been to Fess Parker, so it's right over, and I was like, oh boy. <laughs> they know everywhere I've been, so. Yeah, they're very helpful. If you can't find anybody, you just go to the office and they can look them up on their registry and they'll show you exactly where they are and give you a map. Good one, Santa Barbara Cemetery. All right, I decided to bring Jaw over to the beach. This is a dog-friendly beach, but they have to be on leash, it looks like. I'm not sure he enjoys the water as much as I thought he would. The closer it gets, the more he kind of cowers underneath me. Are you liking the beach? Are you liking the beach weather? Huh? All right, let's go over to uh, what used to be Fess Parker's Red Lion Resort. Pretty easy because it's right across the street. Tsunami hazard zone. Well, that's it. That used to be Fess Parker's Resort, right here on the beach. This whole strip going all the way down was his. I have to guess it was some sort of, you know, family friendly kind of 
getaway resort type deal. See if I could find some old photos to kind of match up what it used to look like here. Now we're gonna head over to Sambo's now. Now Sambo's I had never actually seen in my lifetime other than this one. And I've only ever heard about it because I was a big fan of the Andy Kaufman, Freddie Blassie movie, My Breakfast with Blassie, where they meet up at a Sambo's and have a dinner and it just goes totally awry. Now basically what happened was in 1957, a man who had ran a diner in downtown Santa Barbara for 20 years decided to go into business with a guy who was a restaurant equipment salesman. They took the first name of the man who ran the diner in Santa Barbara, Sam. They shortened the last name of the equipment salesman. They came up with Sambo's. Now Sambo was a apparently a very notoriously racist term. They said they didn't originally start it out that way. However, with the success of the restaurant, they, for whatever reason, adopted the, um, using the artwork of the famous Sambo's book story, and that became their moniker, which was pretty racist, apparently. Um, they even said that when you would come here, the kids would get like a, a blackface mask of Sambo. They have a memorial plaque up here dedicating this being the very first Sambo's and it started in 1957, so this is maybe one of the only ones left. Check it out, check out the plaque. Their big slogan when they opened was that what the world needed now was a good 10 cent cup of coffee and they boasted that you could get a great meal here for $1.25 with bottomless cups of coffee and the original one still exists now of course at some point they had to abandon that whole logo and everything but the chain lives on or at least the original lives on now obviously the problem with this was that they had paintings at the time originally of um, those images, the little Sambo from the children's book all over the walls, and it just obviously made African Americans feel unwelcomed here. And so that's eventually why they came to their senses and just realized whether they believed they did anything wrong or not, whether that name was meant to be the connotation that they wanted. They kept the name, however, they changed all of that motif. They don't use any of that stuff anymore. Now when I say that they eventually came to their senses and changed the motif and everything, it wasn't without a fight. This actually went to court and believe it or not, the restaurant chain, the pancake chain here, Sambo's actually won uh, because the judge said it was a First Amendment right. But basically all the negative publicity had just done so much damage that it was ruining the business. So they that's pretty much why they were eventually got rid of that whole children's book motif. I honestly don't know how you could open a restaurant with that name in the, that time and, you know, and not know. So that kind of makes it seem a little bit crazy, but at the same rate, I think at some point you do have to forgive people and seeing that that's still there, I like seeing that because like I said, I, I have never got to see any in my life and I've always wanted to see one ever since I saw the My Breakfast with Blassie. I've just always been like, God, man, that would have been cool to go to a Sambo's. I don't know why, but there's one and uh, maybe I'll go before I take off today. I wanna to go back and see if Cece's awake and if she wants to come have some lunch. All right, she's still sleeping, so we just went and said goodbye and we're gonna head back to LA. Apparently the vice president is staying in Hollywood now and it's got a bunch of the streets closed off, so I wanna get back before it becomes a big issue, so let's head on back. I think he's pretty much ready to go home. I, th I think he enjoyed himself, but I think he misses his environment. And hopefully we'll be out this way again soon. Cece was one of the coolest people I've ever met. That was a lot of fun hanging out with her. Well, we just rolled in. Ja had a package here from Amazon from Alice. 
Alice Langwa, I hope I'm saying your last name right. Thank you so much. He will definitely appreciate it. <laughs> birthday boy. Yeah, he had a great birthday. Oh, and John ja got some mail from Catherine Piero. Thank you. He loves this stuff. Well, time to say goodbye to this guy. Did a pretty good job. No complaints. Had a little bit of rattling here and there. I don't know what that was all about, but turning it in a day early and uh, getting back to life. Hope they don't try and... Uh, Try and screw me around on this thing. Never know, never know. Well, I'll tell you, not only did we not have any problems, but for whatever reason, um, when the guy was checking me out, he said, hey, I remember when you were here and we were having problems. Like we gave you um, a car that the battery was dead and we just kind of held, prolonged your trip so, uh, so we didn't charge you for the insurance. So that was pretty cool. They saved me like, oh, like 70 bucks. So good on you, Enterprise. But this day and age, it does make you wonder if they were saving me the money on the insurance, was I covered? I would totally agree with that. Well, we just made a trip over to Tailwaggers. I bought him two of the spare ribs that he likes and I realized he never got a little birthday cake, even though he got steak and chicken and all that other nonsense. We got him a little birthday cookie. That's your birthday cookie. It's for you. Well, good evening, my friends. I am worn out. It was a long day of driving and I have a vlog planned tomorrow that I've been invited to do and it's a place I've wanted to get into for a long time so I couldn't turn it down when it came up and this place is so cool that just from the outside I would have been happy to get to vlog it up close but to get inside super excited so I'm gonna call it a night I wanted to thank Melanie Diamond, Sarah Wolf, and Peter Manry for making contributions to my channel and thank you all for watching I hope you enjoyed this road trip I hope to do more in the future very soon. In fact, um, I know the weekend of May 18th, I'm going to have to make another drive because we're going to that rock show and I'm hoping to stay in the Madonna Inn or something cool like that on the way. So stick with me. We'll be out on the road again soon. Have a great night. We'll see you all tomorrow. Goodbye.